The Other Celia by Theodore Sturgeon. Originally published March 1957 edition of Galaxy Magazine. Republished the following year in a collection of the author's short stories entitled A Touch of Strange and then again multiple times in many anthologies. Read by Daryl T. Smith II for my channel, Quasar Spectra. The Other Celia If you live in a cheap enough rooming house and the doors are made of cheap enough pine and the locks are old-fashioned single-action jobs and the hinges are loose and if you have 190 lean pounds to operate with you can grasp the knob, press the door sidewise against its hinges and slip the latch. Further, you can lock the door the same way when you come out. Slim Walsh lived in and was and had and did these things partly because he was bored. The company doctors had laid him up, not off, up, for three weeks after his helper had hit him just over the temple with a 14-inch crescent wrench, pending some more x-rays. If he was going to get just sick leave pay, he wanted to make it stretch. If he was going to get a big fat settlement, all to the good. What he saved by living in this fire trap would make the money look even better. Meanwhile, he felt fine and had nothing to do all day. Slim isn't dishonest, his mother used to tell children's court some years back. He's just curious. She was perfectly right. Slim was constitutionally incapable of borrowing your bathroom without looking into your medicine chest. Send him into your kitchen for a saucer, and when he came out a minute later, he'd have inventoried your refrigerator, your vegetable bin, and since he was six feet three inches tall, he would know about a moldering jar of maraschino cherries in the back of the top shelf that you'd forgotten about. Perhaps Slim, who was not impressed by his impressive size and build, felt that a knowledge that you secretly use hair restorer or are one of those strange people who keeps a little mound of unmated socks in your second drawer gave him a kind of superiority. Or maybe security is a better word. Or maybe it was an odd compensation for one of the most advanced cases of gawking, gasping shyness ever recorded. Whatever it was, Slim liked you better if, while talking to you, he knew how many jackets hung in your closet, how old that unpaid phone bill was, and just where you'd hidden those photographs. On the other hand, Slim didn't insist on knowing bad or even embarrassing things about you. He just wanted to know things about you, period. His current situation was therefore a near paradise. Flimsy doors stood in rows, barely sustaining vacuum on aching vacuum of knowledge. And one by one they imploded at the nudge of his curiosity. He touched nothing, or if he did, he replaced it carefully, and removed nothing. And within a week he knew Mrs. Kuiper's rumors far better than she could or cared to. Each secret visit to the rooms gave him a starting point. Subsequent ones taught him more. He knew not only what these people had, but what they did, where, how much, for how much, and how often. In almost every case, he knew why as well. Almost every case. Celia Sarton came. Now, at various times in various places, Slim had found strange things in other people's rooms. There was an old lady in one shabby place who had an electric train under her bed, used it, too. There was an old spinster in this very building who collected bottles, large and small, of any value or capacity, providing they were round and squat and with long necks. A man on the second floor secretly guarded his desirables with the unloaded twenty-five automatic in his top bureau drawer for which he had a half box of thirty-eight cartridges. There was a, to be chivalrous, girl in one of the rooms who kept fresh-cut flowers, 
before a photograph on her night table, or rather before a frame in which were stacked eight photographs, one of which held the stage each day. Seven days, eight photographs. Slim admired the system. A new love every day, and predictably a different love on successive Wednesdays, and all of them movie stars. Dozens of rooms, dozens of imprints, marks, impressions, overlays, atmospheres of people, and they needn't be odd ones. A woman moves into a room, however standardized. The instant she puts down her dusting powder on top of the flush tank, the room is hers. Something stuck in the ill-fitting frame of a mirror, something draped over the long-dead gas jet, and the samest of rooms begins to shrink toward its occupant as if it wished one day to be a close-knit, form-fitting, individual integument as intimate as a skin. But not Celia Sarton's room. Slim Walsh got a glimpse of her as she followed Mrs. Kuiper up the stairs to the third floor. Mrs. Kuiper, who hobbled, slowed any follower sufficiently to afford the most disinterested witness a good look, and Slim was anything but disinterested. Yet, for days, he could not recall her clearly. It was as if Celia Sarton had been, not invisible, for that would have been memorable in itself, but translucent or chameleon-like, drably re-radiating the drab wall color, carpet color, woodwork color. She was how old? Old enough to pay taxes. How tall? Tall enough. Dressed in whatever women cover themselves with in their statistical thousands. Shoes, hose, skirt, jacket, hat. She carried a bag. When you go to the baggage window at a big terminal, you notice a suitcase here, a steamer trunk there, and all around, high up, far back, there are rows and ranks and racks of luggage not individually noticed, but just there. This bag, Celia Sarton's bag, was one of them. And to Mrs. Kuiper, she said, she said, she said whatever is necessary when one takes a cheap room. And to find her voice, divide the sound of a crowd by the number of people in it. So anonymous, so unnoticeable was she that, aside from being aware that she left in the morning and returned in the evening, Slim let two days go by before he entered her room. He simply could not remind himself about her. And when he did, and had inspected it to his satisfaction, he had his hand on the knob, about to leave, before he recalled that the room was, after all, occupied. Until that second he had thought he was giving one of the vacancies the once over. He did this regularly. It gave him a reference point. He grunted and turned back, flicking his gaze over the room. First, he had to assure himself that he was in the right room, which, for a man of his instinctive orientations, was extraordinary. Then he had to spend a moment of disbelief in his own eyes, which was all but unthinkable. When that passed, he stood in astonishment, staring at the refutation of everything his hobby had taught him about people and the places they live in. The bureau drawers were empty. The ashtray was clean. No toothbrush, toothpaste, soap. In the closet, two wire hangers and one wooden one covered with dirty quilted silk and nothing else. Under the grime gray dresser scarf, nothing. In the shower stall, the medicine chest, nothing and nothing again, except what Mrs. Kuiper had grudgingly installed. Slim went to the bed and carefully turned back the faded coverlet. Maybe she had slept in it, but very possibly not. Mrs. Kuiper specialized in unironed sheets of such a ground-in gray that it wasn't easy to tell. Frowning, Slim put up the coverlet again 
and smoothed it. Suddenly he struck his forehead, which yielded him a flash of pain from his injury. He ignored it. The bag! It was under the bed, shoved there, not hidden there. He looked at it without touching it for a moment, so that it could be returned exactly. Then he hauled it out. It was a black gladstone, neither new nor expensive, of that nondescript rusty color acquired by untended leatherette. It had a worn zipper closure and was not locked. Slim opened it. It contained a cardboard box, crisp and new, for a thousand virgin sheets of cheap white typewriter paper surrounded by a glossy bright blue band bearing a white diamond with the legend... Non Parel, the writer's friend, 15% cotton fiber, trademark registered. Slim lifted the paper out of the box, looked under it, riffled a thumbful of the sheets at the top and the same from the bottom, shook his head, replaced the paper, closed the box, put it back into the bag and restored everything precisely as he had found it. He paused again in the middle of the room, turning slowly once, but there was simply nothing else to look at. He let himself out, locked the door, and went silently back to his room. He sat down on the edge of his bed and at last protested, Nobody lives like that. His room was on the fourth and topmost floor of the old house. Anyone else would have called it the worst room in the place. It was small, dark, shabby, and remote, and it suited him beautifully. Its door had a transom, the glass of which had many times been painted over. By standing on the foot of his bed, Slim could apply one eye to the peephole he had scratched in the paint and look straight down the stairs to the third floor landing. On this landing, hanging to the stub of one of the ancient gas jets, was a cloudy mirror surmounted by a dust-mantled gilt eagle and surrounded by a great many rococo-carved flowers. By careful propping with folded cigarette wrappers, innumerable tests, and a great deal of silent mileage up and down the stairs, Slim had arranged the exact tilt necessary in the mirror so that it covered the second-floor landing as well. And just as a radar operator learns to translate glowing pips and masses into aircraft and weather, so Slim became expert at the interpretation of the fogged and distant image it afforded him. Thus, he had the comings and goings of half the tenants under surveillance without having to leave his room. It was in this mirror at twelve minutes past six that he saw Celia Sarton next, and as he watched her climb the stairs... His eyes glowed. The anonymity was gone. She came up the stairs two at a time, with a gait like bounding. She reached the landing and whirled into her corridor and was gone, and while a part of Slim's mind listened for the way she opened her door, hurriedly rattling the key against the lock plate, banging the door open, slamming it shut, another part studied a mental photograph of her face. What raised its veil of the statistical ordinary was its set purpose. Here were eyes only superficially interested in cars, curbs, stairs, doors. It was as if she had projected every important part of herself into that empty room of hers and waited there impatiently for her body to catch up. There was something in the room or something she had to do there which she could not, would not, wait for. One goes this way to a beloved after a long parting, or to a deathbed in the last precipitous moments. This was not the arrival of one who wants, but of one who needs. Slim buttoned his shirt, eased his door open, and sidled through it. He poised a moment on his landing like a great moose, sensing the air before descending to a water hole, and then moved downstairs. Celia Sarton's only neighbor in the North Corridor, the spinster with the bottles, was settled for the evening. She was of very regular habits, and Slim knew them well. 
Completely confident that he would not be seen, he drifted to the girl's door and paused. She was there, all right. He could see the light around the edges of the ill-fitting door, could sense that difference between an occupied room and an empty one, which exists however silent the occupant might be. And this one was silent. Whatever it was that had driven her into the room with such headlong urgency, whatever it was she was doing, had to do, was being done with no sound or motion that he could detect. For a long time, six minutes, seven, Slim hung there, open-throated to conceal the sound of his breath. At last, shaking his head, he withdrew, climbed the stairs, let himself into his own room, and lay down on the bed, frowning. He could only wait, yet he could wait. No one does any single thing for very long, especially a thing not involving movement. In an hour, in two, it was five. At half past eleven, some faint sound from the floor below brought Slim, half dozing, twisting up from the bed into his high people in the transom. He saw the sergeant girl come out of the corridor slowly and stop and look around at nothing in particular, like someone confined too long in a ship's cabin who has emerged on deck not so much for the lungs' sake but for the eyes. And when she went down the stairs, it was easily and without hurry, as if again the important part of her was in the room. But the something was finished with for now, and what was ahead of her wasn't important and could wait. Standing with his hand on his own doorknob, Slim decided that he too could wait. The temptation to go straight to her room was, of course, large, but caution also loomed. What he had tentatively established as her habit patterns did not include midnight exits. He could not know when she might come back, and it would be foolish indeed to jeopardize his hobby, not only where it included her, but all of it, by being caught. He sighed, mixing resignation with anticipatory pleasure, and went to bed. Less than fifteen minutes later, he congratulated himself with a sleepy smile as he heard her slow footsteps mount the stair below. He slept. There was nothing in the closet. There was nothing in the ashtray. There was nothing in the medicine chest nor under the dresser scarf. The bed was made, the dresser drawers were empty, and under the bed was the cheap gladstone. In it was a box containing a thousand sheets of typing paper surrounded by a glossy blue band. Without disturbing this, Slim riffled the sheets, once at the top, once at the bottom. He grunted, shook his head, and then proceeded automatically but meticulously to put everything back as he had found it. Whatever it is this girl does at night, he said glumly, it leaves tracks like it makes noise. He left. The rest of the day was unusually busy for Slim. In the morning, he had a doctor's appointment, and in the afternoon he spent hours with a company lawyer who seemed determined to a. deny the existence of any head injury and b. prove to Slim in the world that the injury must have occurred years ago. He got absolutely nowhere. If Slim had another characteristic as consuming and compulsive as his curiosity, it was his shyness. These two could stand on one another's shoulders, though, and still look upward at Slim's stubbornness. It served its purpose. It took hours, however, and it was after seven when he got home. He paused at the third floor landing and glanced down the corridor. Celia Sarton's room was occupied and silent. If she emerged around midnight, exhausted and relieved, then he would know she had again raced up the stairs to her urgent, motionless task, whatever it was. And here he checked himself. He had long ago learned the uselessness of cluttering up his busy head with conjectures. 
a thousand things might happen. In each case, only one would. He would wait, then, and could. And again, some hours later, he saw her come out of her corridor. She looked about, but he knew she saw very little. Her face was withdrawn and her eyes wide and unguarded. Then, instead of going out, she went back into her room. He slipped downstairs half an hour later and listened at her door and smiled. She was washing her lingerie at the hand basin. It was a small thing to learn, but he felt he was making progress. It did not explain why she lived as she did, but indicated how she could manage without so much as a spare handkerchief. Oh well, maybe in the morning. In the morning, there was no maybe. He found it. He found it, though he could not know what it was he'd found. He laughed at first, not in triumph, but wryly, calling himself a clown. Then he squatted on his heels in the middle of the floor. He would not sit on the bed for fear of leaving wrinkles of his own on those Mrs. Kuiper supplied, and carefully lifted the box of paper out of the suitcase and put it on the floor in front of him. Up to now, he had contented himself with a quick riffle of the blank paper. A little at the top, a little at the bottom. He had done just this again without removing the box from the suitcase, but only taking the top off and tilting up the banded ream of Nonpareil the writer's friend. And almost in spite of himself, his quick eye had caught the briefest flash of pale blue. Gently, he removed the band, sliding it off the pack of paper, being careful not to slit the glossy finish. Now he could freely riffle the pages, and when he did, he discovered that all of them, except a hundred or so, top and bottom, had the same rectangular cutout, leaving only a narrow margin all the way around. In the hollow space thus formed, something was packed. He could not tell what the something was, except that it was pale tan, with a tinge of pink, and felt like smooth, untextured leather. There was a lot of it, neatly folded so that it exactly fitted the hole in the ream of paper. He puzzled over it for some minutes without touching it again, and then scrubbing his fingertips against his shirt until he felt that they were quite free of moisture and grease, he gently worked loose the top corner of the substance and unfolded a layer. All he found was more of the same. He folded it down flat again to be sure he could, and then brought more of it out. He soon realized that the material was of an irregular shape and almost certainly of one piece, so that folding it into a tight rectangle required care and great skill. Therefore, he proceeded very slowly, stopping every now and then to fold it up again, and took him more than an hour to get enough of it out so that he could identify it. Identify? It was completely unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was a human skin done in some substance very like the real thing. The first fold, the one which had been revealed at first, was an area of the back, which was why it showed no features. One might liken it to a balloon, except that a deflated balloon is smaller in every dimension than an inflated one. As far as Slim could judge, this was life-sized, a little over five feet long and proportioned accordingly. The hair was peculiar, looking exactly like the real thing until flexed, and then revealing itself to be one piece. It had Celia Sarton's face. Slim closed his eyes and opened them, and found that it was still true. He held his breath and put forth a careful, steady forefinger and gently pressed the left eyelid upward. There was an eye under it, all right, light blue and seemingly moist, but flat. Slim released the breath closed the eye and sat back on his heels. His feet were beginning to tingle from his having knelt on the floor for so long. 
He looked all around the room once to clear his head of strangeness and then began to fold the thing up again. It took a while, but when he was finished, he knew he had it right. He replaced the typewriter paper in the box and the box in the bag, put the bag away, and at last stood in the middle of the room in the suspension which overcame him when he was deep in thought. After a moment of this, he began to inspect the ceiling. It was made of stamped tin, like those of many old-fashioned houses. It was grimy and flaked and stained. Here and there, rust showed through, and in one or two places, edges of the tin sheets had sagged. Slim nodded to himself in profound satisfaction, listened for a while at the door, let himself out, locked it, and went upstairs. He stood in his own corridor for a minute, checking the position of doors, the hall window, and his accurate orientation of the same things on the floor below. Then he went into his own room. His room, though smaller than most, was one of the few in the house which was blessed with a real closet instead of a rickety, off-the-floor wardrobe. He went into it and knelt, and grunted in satisfaction, when he found how loose the ancient, unpainted floorboards were. By removing the side baseboard, he found it possible to get to the airspace between the fourth floor and the third floor ceiling. He took out boards until he had an opening perhaps 14 inches wide, and then, working in almost total silence, he began cleaning away dirt and old plaster. He did this meticulously, because... When he finally pierced the tin sheeting, he wanted not one grain of dirt to fall into the room below. He took his time, and it was late in the afternoon when he was satisfied with his preparations and began, with his knife, on the tin. It was thinner and softer than he had dared to hope. He almost overcut on the first try. Carefully, he squeezed the sharp steel into the little slot he had cut, lengthening it. When it was somewhat less than an inch long, he withdrew all but the point of the knife and twisted it slightly, moved it a sixteenth of an inch and twisted again, repeating this all down the cut until he had widened it enough for his purposes. He checked the time, then returned to Celia Sarton's room for just long enough to check the appearance of his work from that side. He was very pleased with it. The little cut had come through a foot away from the wall over the bed and was a mere pencil line lost in the Baroque design with which the tin was stamped and the dirt and rust that marred it. He returned to his room and sat down to wait. He heard the old house coming to its evening surge of life, a voice here, a door there, footsteps, on the stairs. He ignored them all as he sat on the edge of his bed, hands folded between his knees, eyes half closed, immobile like a machine, fueled, oiled, tuned, and ready, lacking only the right touch on the right control. And like that touch, the faint sound of Celia Sarton's footsteps moved him. To use his new peephole, he had to lie on the floor, half in and half out of the closet, with his head in the hole, actually below floor level. With this, he was perfectly content, any amount of discomfort being well worth his trouble, an attitude he shared with many another ardent hobbyist, mountain climber or speleologist, duck hunter or bird watcher. When she turned on the light, he could see her splendidly as well as most of the floor, the lower third of the door, and part of the wash basin in the bathroom. She had come in hurriedly with that same agonized haste he had observed before. At the same second she turned on the light, she had apparently flung her handbag toward the bed. It was in mid-air as the light appeared. She did not even glance its way, but hastily fumbled the old gladstone from under the bed, opened it, removed the box, opened it, took out the paper, slipped off the blue band and removed the blank sheets of paper which covered the hollowed-out ream. 
She scooped out the thing hidden there, shaking it once like a grocery clerk with a folded paper sack, so that the long, limp thing straightened itself out. She arranged it carefully on the worn linoleum of the floor, arms down at the side, legs slightly apart, face up, neck straight. Then she lay down on the floor, too, head to head with the deflated thing. She reached up over her head, took hold of the collapsed image of herself about the region of the ears, and for a moment did some sort of manipulation of it against the top of her own head. Slim heard faintly a sharp, chitinous click, like the sound one makes by snapping the edge of a thumbnail against the edge of a fingernail. Her hands slipped to the cheeks of the figure, and she pulled at the empty head as if testing a connection. The head seemed now to have adhered to hers. Then she assumed the same pose she had arranged for this other, letting her hands fall wearily to her sides on the floor, closing her eyes. For a long while, nothing seemed to be happening except for the odd way she was breathing, very deeply but very slowly, like the slow-motion picture of someone panting, gasping for breath after a long, hard run. After perhaps ten minutes of this, the breathing became shallower and even slower, until at the end of a half hour, he could detect none at all. Slim lay there immobile for more than an hour, until his body shrieked protest and his head ached from eye strain. He hated to move, but move he must. Silently, he backed out of the closet, stood up, and stretched. It was a great luxury, and he deeply enjoyed it. He felt moved to think over what he had just seen, but clearly and consciously decided not to. Not yet, anyway. When he was unkinked again, he crept back into the closet, put his head in the hole and his eye to the slot. Nothing had changed. She still lay quiet, utterly relaxed, so much so that her hands had turned palm upward. Slim watched, and he watched, just as he was about to conclude that this was the way the girl spent her entire nights and that there would be nothing more to see, he saw a slight and sudden contraction about the region of her solar plexus, and then another. For a time, there was nothing more. And then the empty thing attached to the top of her head began to fill, and Celia Sarton began to empty. Slim stopped breathing until it hurt and watched in total astonishment. Once it had started, the process progressed swiftly. It was as if something passed from the clothed body of the girl to this naked, empty thing. The something, whatever it might be, had to be fluid, for nothing but a fluid would fill a flexible container in just this way, or make a flexible container slowly and evenly flatten out like this. Slim could see the fingers, which had been folded flat against the palms, inflate and move until they took on the normal relaxed curl of a normal hand. The elbows shifted a little to lie more normally against the body, and yes, it was a body now. The other one was not a body anymore. It lay foolishly limp in its garments, its sleeping face slightly distorted by its flattening. The fingers fell against the palms by their own limp weight, the shoes thumped quietly on their sides, heels together, toes pointing in opposite directions. The exchange was done in less than ten minutes, and then the newly filled body moved. It flexed its hands tentatively, drew up its knees, and stretched its legs out again, arched its back against the floor. Its eyes flickered open. It put up its arms and made some deft manipulation at the top of its head, Slim heard another version of the soft, hard click, and the now-empty head fell flat to the floor. 
The new Celia Sarton sat up and sighed and rubbed her hands lightly over her body as if restoring circulation and sensation to a chilled skin. She stretched as comfortingly and luxuriously as Slim had a few minutes earlier. She looked rested and refreshed. At the top of her head, Slim caught a glimpse of a slit through which a wet whiteness showed, but it seemed to be closing. In a brief time, nothing showed there but a small valley in the hair like a normal parting. She sighed again and got up. She took the clothed thing on the floor by the neck, raised it and shook it twice to make the clothes fall away. She tossed it to the bed and carefully picked up the clothes and deployed them about the room, the undergarments in the wash basin, the dress and slip on a hanger in the wardrobe. Moving leisurely but with purpose, she went into the bathroom and, except for her shins down, out of Slim's range of vision. There he heard the same faint domestic sounds he had once detected outside her door as she washed her underclothes. She emerged in due course, went to the wardrobe for some wire hangers, and took them into the bathroom. Back she came with the underwear folded on the hangers, which she hooked to the top of the open wardrobe door. Then she took the deflated integument, which lay crumpled on the bed, shook it again, rolled it up and into a ball, and took it into the bathroom. Slim heard more water running and sudsing noises, and by ear followed the operation through a soaping and two rinses. Then she came out again, shaking out the object, which had apparently just been wrung, pulled it through a wooden clothes hanger, arranged it creaselessly depending from the crossbar of the hanger with the bar about at its waistline, and hung it with the others on the wardrobe door. Then she lay down on the bed, not to sleep or to read or even to rest. She seemed very rested, but merely to wait until it was time to do something else. By now, Slim's bones were complaining again, so he wormed noiselessly backward out of his lookout point, got into his shoes and a jacket, and went out to get something to eat. When he came home an hour later and looked, her light was out and he could see nothing. He spread his overcoat carefully over the hole in the closet so no stray light from his room would appear in the little slot in the ceiling, closed the door, read a comic book for a while, and went to bed. The next day, he followed her. What strange occupation she might have, what weird vampiric duties she might disclose, he did not speculate on. He was doggedly determined to gather information first and think later. What he found out about her daytime activities was, if anything, more surprising than any wild surmise. She was a clerk in a small five and ten on the east side. She ate in the store's lunch bar at lunchtime, a green salad and a surprising amount of milk, and in the evening she stopped at a hot dog stand and drank a small container of milk, though she ate nothing. Her steps were slowed by then, and she moved wearily, speeding up only when she was close to the rooming house, and then apparently all but overcome with eagerness to get home and into something more comfortable. She was watched in this process, and Slim, had he disbelieved his own eyes the first time, must believe them now. So it went for a week, three days of which Slim spent in shadowing her, every evening in watching her make her strange toilet. Every twenty-four hours she changed bodies, carefully washing, drying, folding, and putting away the one she was not using. Twice during the week she went out for what was apparently a constitutional and nothing more, a half hour around midnight when she would stand on the walk in front of the rooming house or wander around the block. At work, she was silent, but not unnaturally so. She spoke, when spoken to, in a small, unmusical voice. She seemed to have no friends. She maintained her aloofness, 
by being uninteresting and by seeking no one out and by needing no one. She evinced no outside interests, never going to the movies or to the park. She had no dates, not even with girls. Slim thought she did not sleep, but lay quietly in the dark, waiting for it to be time to get up and go to work. And when he came to think about it, as ultimately he did, it occurred to Slim that within the anthill in which we all live and have our being, enough privacy can be exacted to allow for all sorts of strangeness in the members of society, providing the strangeness is not permitted to show. If it is a man's pleasure to sleep upside down like a bat, and if he so arranges his life that no one ever sees him sleeping, or his sleeping place, why, bat-like he may sleep all the days of his life. One need not, by these rules, even be a human being. Not if the mimicry is good enough. It is a measure of Slim's odd personality to report that Celia Sarton's ways did not frighten him. He was, if anything, less disturbed by her now than he'd been before he had begun to spy on her. He knew what she did in her room and how she lived. Before, he had not known. Now, he did. This made him much happier. He was, however, still curious. His curiosity would never drive him to do what another man might, to speak to her on the stairs or on the street, get to know her and more about her. He was too shy for that. Nor was he moved to report to anyone the odd practice he watched each evening. It wasn't his business to report. She was doing no harm, as far as he could see. In his cosmos, everybody had a right to live and make a buck if they could. Yet his curiosity, its immediacy taken care of, did undergo a change. It was not in him to wonder what sort of being this was and whether its ancestors had grown up among human beings, living with them in caves and in tents, developing and evolving along with Homo sap, until it could assume the uniform of the smallest and most invisible of wage workers, he would never reach the conclusion that in the fight for survival a species might discover that a most excellent characteristic for survival among human beings might be not to fight them, but to join them. No, Slim's curiosity was far simpler, more basic, and less informed than any of these conjectures. He simply changed the field of his wonderment from what to what if. So it was that on the eighth day of his survey, a Tuesday, he went again to her room, got the bag, opened it, removed the box, opened it, removed the ream of paper, slid the blue band off, removed the covering sheets, took out the second Celia Sarton, put her on the bed, and then replaced paper, blue band, box cover, box, and bag, just as he had found them. He put the folded thing under his shirt and went out carefully locking the door behind him in his special way, and went upstairs to his room. He put his prize under the four clean shirts in his bottom drawer and sat down to await Celia Sarton's homecoming. She was a little late that night, twenty minutes perhaps. The delay seemed to have increased both her fatigue and her eagerness. She burst in feverishly, moved with the rapidity of near panic. She looked drawn and pale, and her hands shook. She fumbled the bag from under the bed, snatched out the box, and opened it, contrary to her usual measured movements, by inverting it over the bed and dumping out its contents. When she saw nothing there but sheets of paper, some with a wide rectangle cut from them and some without, she froze. She crouched over that bed without moving for an interminable two minutes. Then she straightened up slowly and glanced about the room. Once she fumbled through the paper, but resignedly, without hope, she made one sound, a high, sad whimper, and from that moment on was silent. She went to the window slowly, her feet dragging, her shoulders slumped. For a long time, she stood looking out at the city, 
its growing darkness, its growing colonies of lights, each a symbol of life and life's usages. Then she drew down the blind and went back to the bed. She stacked the papers there with loose, uncaring fingers and put the heap of them on the dresser. She took off her shoes and placed them neatly side by side on the floor by the bed. She lay down in the same utterly relaxed pose she affected when she made her change, hands down and open, legs a little apart. Her face looked like a death mask, its tissues sunken and sagging. It was flushed and sick-looking. There was a little of the deep, regular breathing, but only a little. There was a bit of the fluttering contractions at the midriff, but only a bit. Then, nothing. Slim backed away from the people and sat up. He felt very bad about this. He had been only curious. He hadn't wanted her to get sick, to die for he was sure she had died. How could he know what sort of sleep surrogate an organism like this might require, or what might be the results of a delay in changing? What could he know of the chemistry of such a being? He had thought vaguely of slipping down the next day while she was out and returning her property, just to see, just to know, what if, just out of curiosity. Should he call a doctor? She hadn't. She hadn't even tried, though she must have known much better than he did how serious her predicament was. Yet if a species depended for its existence on secrecy, it would be species survival to let an individual die undetected. Well, maybe not calling a doctor meant that she'd be all right after all. Doctors would have a lot of silly questions to ask. She might even tell the doctor about her other skin, and if Slim was the one who had fetched the doctor, Slim might be questioned about that. Slim didn't want to get involved with anything. He just wanted to know things. He thought, I'll take another look. He crawled back into the closet and put his head in the hole. Celia Sarton, he knew instantly, would not survive this. Her face was swollen. Her eyes protruded, and her purpled tongue lolled far, too far from the corner of her mouth. Even as he watched, her face darkened still more, and the skin of it crinkled until it looked like carbon paper, which has been balled up tight and then smoothed out. The very beginnings of an impulse to snatch the thing she needed out of his shirt drawer and rush it down to her died within him for he saw a wisp of smoke emerge from her nostrils. And then Slim cried out, snatched his head from the hole, bumping it cruelly, and clapped his hands over his eyes. Put the biggest size flash bulb an inch from your nose and fire it, and you might get a flare approaching the one he got through his little slot in the tin ceiling. He sat grunting in pain and watching on the insides of his eyelids, migrations of flaming worms. At last they faded, and he tentatively opened his eyes. They hurt, and the afterimage of the slot hung before him, but at least he could see. Feet pounded on the stairs. He smelled smoke and a burned, oily, unpleasant something which he could not identify. Someone shouted. Someone hammered on a door. Then someone screamed and screamed. It was in the papers next day. Mysterious, the story said. Charles Fort, in Low, had reported many such cases, and there had been others, since people burned to a crisp by a fierce heat which had nevertheless not destroyed clothes or bedding while leaving nothing for autopsy. This was, said the paper, either an unknown kind of heat or heat of such intensity and such brevity that it would do such a thing. No known relatives, it said. Police mystified. No clues or suspects. Slim didn't say anything to anybody. He wasn't curious about the matter anymore. He closed up the hole in the closet that same night, and next day, after he read the story, 
He used the newspaper to wrap up the thing in his shirt drawer. It smelled pretty bad, and even that early was too far gone to be unfolded. He dropped it into a garbage can on the way to the lawyer's office on Wednesday. They settled his lawsuit that afternoon, and he moved 